All right, let's start talking a little bit, or a lot. Ooh, it's going to be a long day. About um, land sales, okay? Sale of land, that's what we're talking about. Real estate transactions. By the way, there is a course that is offered by uh, Professor Marsha Johnson in which she spends the whole semester just on real estate transactions. So those of you that are interested in that, that might be a good course to take. It's not an easy course, but it's a good course. And you may want to consider that for those of you that like to do real estate uh, next year. All right. Um, as you remember, I kind of created for you a timetable. And I said, you need to put things in perspective in the timetable in order to identify what the issues are. And we said that the land transaction begins when somebody puts up a sign or an announcement that says condominium for sale, house for sale, farm for sale, whatever for sale. That's when everything begins. Um, and after that, people start looking and when somebody's pretty confident that they're interested in the property, right, they secure the property by, by using an earnest money agreement or a contract for sale. They call both things. Contract for sale, earnest money agreement. Again, this, this agreement, uh, purchase and sale agreement, earnest money agreement, contract for sale, is um, is entered by a buyer is, a, is an agreement in which a buyer and a seller enter into an understanding that uh, uh, with that you know in which they in which they make it clear that they they are making a at least a commitment that's what it is is a commitment um, to acquire the property. This is not the acquisition of the property yet, it's a commitment. And there are a lot of issues that arise in this process, during this purchase and sale agreement. A lot of things we're going to talk about that refer directly to that conditional agreement. At one point, that conditional agreement becomes permanent at closing. Um, and in the date of closing, um, the, the, the things happen, and certain things must be available at that time. It's the day when the seller delivers the property, and the buyer pays. And at that point, we have now a new document called a deed. Right? Um, this deed is going to contain, depending on what type of deed, it will contain certain promises, certain covenants, uh, of which a breach of any of them would give rise to damages. So far so good? Uh, now, once you have that deed, and there's a lot of issues we're going to talk about regarding that deed and the promises. Once you have that deed, there are ways of assuring your property, assuring the deed, and that's by recording it. Uh, this is what we're going to talk about, the recording statutes. Right? Now, remember, and we're going to repeat this, re uh, recording is not a requirement for the transfer of the property. Recording is simply a way of you assuring yourself, of you telling the whole world, hey, don't mess with my property. This is mine. And it protects you from subsequent purchasers. It protects you, uh, protects a subsequent purchaser from liens and mortgages. Uh, well, liens and mortgages are a thing, but it's a way, it's how our system works. Uh, this is a difference between us and England, where recording statutes don't exist. And it has an impact on how we do business. Um, it may be a reason why real estate. It's, it's so available in this country 
uh, as opposed to other countries and how uh, there are less problems. Uh, it's also might be the reason why there's a lot of rich lawyers in real estate uh, transactions uh, making a lot of money. But nevertheless, that's what we're going to do. And the last thing is that we may not get to is the issue of insurance. Assurance by recording insurance to protect yourself. But I don't know, since we did that so recently, I don't know if we are going to have time to get to that. I don't know if we need to get to that. So that's the scheme. That's the drawing. That's where we're going, right? So where do we begin? We begin with that purchase and sale agreement, contract for sale, earnest money agreement. All those are synonyms. Uh, different people like to call them different things. I know for a fact that I like to call it the purchase and sale agreement. I know for a fact that Professor Clevin likes to call it the earnest money agreement. Uh, I know for fairly certain that Professor Davis likes to call it the contract for sale. But they all mean the same thing. I'm giving you all that because depending on who writes the question on the final exam, it's going to be named like that. Right? We try not to confuse you, but be ready. When you see earnest money agreement, we're talking about the purchase and sale agreement, the contract for sale. Okay? So where do we start? Well, the first thing we have to say is, well, once we enter into this conditional agreement, is it enforceable? Is it enforceable? Well, one thing that we, we look at for enforceability is the statute of frauds. Does it meet the statute of frauds? Um, and in order to meet, you know, to meet the statute of frauds, uh, there's certain things that must be contained in the memorandum, in the document. Remember, uh, a document, as long as it contains the elements, it doesn't matter what it is. A lot of things, you know this from contracts, a lot of things may constitute a document. Uh, you, you have in contracts a case of the lady that sells perfumes, I believe it is, that uh, there was eight or nine different pieces of paper, and they all became a contract because they were linked with each other, and all they had was headings, and, you know, uh, memos, and you know. So, uh, don't 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 think of a of a document simply in terms of a you know something official from the um, from a realty company. You know, as long as it has the the elements we will be speaking of. It meets the requirements. As long as it meets the statute of fraud and it contains the essential elements of the transaction, then it, it is a valid document. So, what must be there? What must be in that document? Well, first, the earnest money agreement, uh, purchase and sale agreement, must identify the parties. Now, in the contract for sale, it's going to be a little different than the deed. You must identify both parties. The seller and the buyer, the vendor, purchaser. Vendor, seller, buyer, purchaser. Okay? Uh, you must identify both parties. What else do you need in that document? The land must be described. These are things that must be there. We need to have the parties. The land must be described. <coughs> now be careful, because all that's required in terms of the description of the land is what is known as reasonable precision. Um, you can always bring evidence, parole evidence, to clarify. And you know that from contracts. The parole evidence rule if it's not a document that's complete, you can always bring evidence from outside. As long as it doesn't contradict, you can bring it to clarity. The same thing here. So all you need is reasonable certainty. For example, my lot on State Street. Right? My lot on State Street. Um, as long as um, I only have one lot, on State Street, right? Um, we can bring, to clarify that, we can bring extrinsic evidence. That's sufficient. That's sufficient to constitute 
uh, um, a valid description on the statute of frauds. Reasonable precision. <coughs> statute of frauds. What are we trying to avoid? Fraud. Right? To avoid fraud, it must be clear that this is a sale. You know, I can, you know, I sell as I sell uh, I'm selling you or words to that extent. Convey words of sale. Why do we want to do that? Because we don't want on the day of closing, right, for the seller to show up with a lease. And you say, well, I wasn't going to rent the place. I was going to buy it. Oh, no, that's not what we said. Well, I I'm pulling back. Oh, you're breaching our agreement. Right? So you want to make sure that it's clear in the document that this is a sale. This is a sale. Here is, so, uh, here is somewhere that the four sections have a little disagreement on, but we're going to follow the rule as I'm going to state it now. So if, if, if this is the rule we're going to follow. Purchase price. Purchase price. If the parties have agreed to the purchase price, it must be in it. It must be there. If the parties have not agreed to the purchase price, it doesn't have to be there, but something must be in the document <coughs> expressing how that price will be determined. That's in the event the parties have not agreed. Right? So, again, if the parties agree to the price, it must be in the document. If they have not, it doesn't have to be in the document. However, there must be something in the document that tells us, <coughs> that tells the reader or whoever is looking at the document, what method is going to be used to determine the price. Can the purchase price serve as kind of like serve to show the intent of sale? Not necessarily. So that's like a different thing from work of sale. That's right. Uh, we agreed to pay $50. It doesn't say it's for sale. I, mean, I want to sell you a house for $50. That's the words of sale. Sell you a house for $50. The fact that you agree on a price doesn't necessarily mean it's for sale. All right. Um, signatures. It must be signed. But in this case, Right? Um, think about this. It doesn't have to be signed by both parties. Now here's the, here's, here's the point. If one party doesn't sign it, right? But let me start again. It must be signed by the party to be charged. So that is a valid contract as to the person that signed it. Is it, it meets the statute of frauds as to the person that signed it, if that person is to be charged. But it doesn't if the person did not, is not being charged. Simply put, you and I enter into a, I'm a seller, you're the buyer, we enter into a uh, purchase and sale agreement for sale, correct? You sign it, I don't. You breach, I sue you, we have a memorandum. I breach, you sue me, I raise a defense, statute of frauds. I didn't sign it because I'm the party to be charged, I'm the party being sued, correct? And I never signed it. Again, again, what is it that you must be thinking when you have problems that have to do with the writing? It's the avoidance of fraud. You can understand easily how a person that doesn't sign it, that doesn't, how somebody can say, well, you agreed when you, we didn't. And if we don't have the requirement of the signature, right, we get into he said, she, he said, she said, I did, I didn't do, I didn't sell it, yes, you did, you told me on the phone, no, I didn't. And now we have a big lawsuit, long, long time, a lot of money, correct? And we don't know who's telling the truth. We don't know who's telling the truth. That's why the statute of fraud wants us to at least, as a person that's being charged, sued to have a signature in order for that agreement to be uh, valid. Remember that 
that agreement has to also, for any other reason, be enforceable. Outside of the elements of the statute of fraud, it has to be an enforceable agreement. And here we talk a little bit about contracts. Right? If you have a, if you have a purchase and sale agreement, and there's a memorandum that has the uh, parties identified, the land described, words of sales, purchase price, the signature of both parties, but it's the matter of it, it's, it's your second contract, one of the parties was uh, a minor, right? It's an unenforceable contract, therefore, it, you know, the, 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 the purchase and sale agreement is not enforceable. So, it must be enforceable to begin with, and the memorandum, to be a valid memorandum, taking it out of the statute of frauds, must contain those elements. Um, date of performance, the date of closing, doesn't have to be there. Insurance requirement doesn't have to be there. So that those are things that do not need to be in the document. Please, think about this because for me and for the bar exam and for everybody else, it's very easy to write questions on this. This is a very easy area to write questions about. So it's not insignificant to understand what the memorandum, what the requirement of the memorandum is in terms of the purchase and sale agreement. Suppose that you don't have a memorandum. There is an exception to the statute of frauds uh, where it will be enforceable even if it's not a memorandum, and that has to do with the part performance doctrine. There are two theories on part performance, two strands of reasons why, uh, what places where part performance is um, <coughs> derived from, and you hear these words a lot. Um, one of the reasons is what's called unequivocal referability. The, the, um, the actions of the parties unequivocally refer to the transaction. Right? If it's something, if you're performing, if your performance has nothing to do with the sale of the house, then you cannot raise the doctrine of our performance. Um, you know, you and I agreed to, uh, I'm gonna sell you a house, Right? We put that in writing, and then on the day of closing, orally, we agree that you're going to pick up the leaves in the yard. Right? That's what we agree. And then I, seller, never pick up the leaves in the yard. The, the leaves in the yard for three weeks, the leaves are piling up there. You call me up and you say, hey, that was our agreement. Right? Um, well, suppose that uh, um, uh, that is not it's not, it has nothing to do with the sale of the land. Picking up the leaves has nothing to do with the actual transaction of selling the land. Therefore, picking up the leaves is not the kind of thing that you can say is, uh, is unequivocal, unequivocally uh, referred to in the transaction. It's not it's irrelevant. It's an agreement, but it's not, uh, it's not tied to the transaction. That's one of the theories of our performance. The other one is against equity. You know, I mean, look, it, it, it's unfair um, to, you know, if you went out and, and did something that has to do with transaction, with the transaction, it would be unfair, that, you know, to then say, after you spend money, after you improved a lot, etc., etc., it would be unfair to then say, oh, sorry. You know, no deal because he wasn't in writing. So those are the two, two theories that um, kind of the, 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 the strands that push part performance. So what are the rules in general? Well, uh, in the majority of jurisdictions, for there to be part performance, um, there must have been payment. <laughs> There must be possession of the land with the permission of the seller, and you must have made improvements. Those three things 
must be present in the majority of jurisdictions. Pay price, possess the property with permission, and improve the property. If you have done those three things, if you have done those three things, you have now partly performed and you're taken out of the statute of frauds. That's sufficient to get you out of the statute of frauds. We know from one of the cases we did in Hickey versus Green, remember the, the lady with the check, um, that, that the court said, look, if the seller or the person that breach, breaches admits that there was a conversation, then we don't have to look at any of these three things, whether there was um, uh, whether there was improvements or payment or um, uh, possession. We don't have to look at any of those. All we have to look at is reliance. Did the party reasonably rely on the words of the other? In that case, remember, what was their reliance? They sold their house right. thinking that they were buying the other one. And the court said that by itself, even though they never possessed the land, even though they never paid the purchase price, even though they never made improvements of the land, the seller admitted that we had the conversation. And the court says since, since she admitted that you had the conversation, all that has to be shown is reliance. That's a part performance. So this is the first part of the purchase and sale agreement, the contract for sale. First issue that comes up between the time the sign is posted and the day of closing. One of the big issues, one of the first issues that always comes up was the document in writing, right? Uh, the second thing that arises during this period is what is known as the doctrine of equitable conversion. Equitable conversion. What are we talking about? Well. Equity says that even though we have a conditional agreement, all right, and even though that agreement doesn't give me the right to possess the land, right, still I should be treated as the owner. That's what equitable conversion is. Me, the buyer, once I sign that purchase and sale agreement, I should be treated like if I was the owner, even though. I am not the owner. Now again, it's equitable. It, it, that purchase and sale agreement doesn't give me the right to possess the land. It doesn't give me that right. Now, we can make an agreement and you can let me possess it. Move in there. But it doesn't give me that right. Um, what equitable, equitable conversion comes to play uh, in the situation where either one, the, the seller or the buyer, um, dies. That's one place where we can look at the uh, doctrine of equitable conversion. What happens? Seller and buyer made a conditional agreement. Conditional. Conditional upon me getting money, conditional upon the title being good, etc., etc. Right? We're going to meet and we're going to exchange property for money, correct? But we, nevertheless, uh, we have an agreement. We have a contract, right? Uh, it's an agreement. It's a contract. So what happens when the seller dies? Does that mean that now that the seller died, the contract is off? Well, we know that once there's an offer and once there's an acceptance, right, uh, uh, the contract's still on. Now, if, if the seller dies before you accept the offer, the offer is terminated. But here we have an agreement already. This is not where we still are at the offer and acceptance stage. We already have an agreement. And equitable conversion says that the moment we have an agreement, the buyer should be treated as if he or she was the owner. Correct? So when the seller dies, what happens? Well, the buyer has the right still to the property be delivered to her at closing. He has the right. If all the conditions are met, seller still has the right, even though, I mean a buyer, even though the seller died, you show up at closing, and that house has to be delivered. 
who has to deliver their house? The heirs of the realty. Whoever, whoever by virtue of the seller dying, acquired for whatever mean, by descent, uh, by whatever, by will, by whatever, whoever acquired the property, that's the person that has to show up at closing and deliver it. Who gets the money? The yeah. whoever in the in, when the seller dies got the money from the seller. That's the person. Now that doesn't usually happen because in most wills uh, somebody leaves everything to the wife or the children or split the money among all of you. But you know we're looking at a situation where once one daughter gets the real the real property and the other daughter gets the money, right? Um, in that, in that situation, the daughter that got the property delivers it. The daughter that got the money pays for it. Gets the money, I'm sorry. Gets the money. What happens if the buyer dies? It's the opposite. Buyer dies and one of the uh, children left decides, well, I, you know, I don't want to buy the house. I'd rather have the money. Let's back out of the deal. No, you can't. We have a contract. Right? And in fact, on the day of the closing, Somebody has to bring the money. Who brings the money? The person that received the money. Who gets the house? The, the heir or the, the vicee or whatever you want to call it that gets the houses, the property, the real, the real property. That's the person that gets the house. That's the effect of equitable conversion. Yes? Have that's right. Well, no, the one that had the equitable interest was the was the buyer. But once the buyer dies, correct? Who follows through on that interest? The heirs. The heirs. Well, I don't want to say the heirs because heirs means what? There's no will. There's an heir, right? If there was a, a will, then the devices, etc., etc. Those are more. I, mean, I don't want to get into those terms because that's more wills. And, and you'll learn more about that next year in uh, wills and trust. All right. Um, what if what, what happens if neither of them die? Simply the house burns down. What happens if all that happens is the house burns down? Right? Then what do you do? Well, what comes into play here is called the risk of loss. In most jurisdictions, the risk of loss is on the purchaser. In most jurisdictions, the risk of loss is on the purchaser. There is a thing that Congress passed called the Uniform Vendor and Purchaser Act. In that case, if the jurisdiction follows that, the risk of loss is on the person that possesses the property. If the buyer is in possession, the buyer has the risk of loss. If the seller is in possession, the seller bears the risk of loss. But still, the majority of jurisdictions, the purchaser, bears the risk of loss. Why is that important? Why is that important? Insurance. Insurance. Um, if you buy property and you're in a jurisdiction in which the purchaser uh, bears the risk of loss, what do you want to do when you're the purchaser? You want to get insurance. Because if you don't have insurance and the property burns, guess what you're getting? You're getting a lot with a burnt house. And you say, but why? You know, the house burned <coughs> down on the contract law that appears to be an impossibility of performance. That's not true. We have an agreement. We have an agreement on the contract for sale. The, 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 the impossibility of performance is a different, it's a different animal. Okay? Um, so you, you bear the risk of loss. You get insurance. Now here's, here's, here's the problem. Suppose that the burden, the burden or the risk of loss is on the purchaser, but only the 
buyer is insured. What happens in that case? Well, in that case, the buyer has to either reduce the value of the property by the amount of the insurance, or he has to do what? Turn over the money to the buyer. Now listen carefully to what I said. That's only when the risk of loss is on the buyer, and only the purchaser is insured. Seller. Seller, I'm sorry. The seller is insured. Okay? So, you're a lawyer, and you are representing a seller, right? What, what's the, what, what is it that you want to make sure happens? That they, if it's the risk of loss is on the buyer, right? That they get insurance. That they get insurance. You, you want to make sure they get insurance. Can you repeat that one more time? Yeah. If only the seller is insured? Yes. If the risk of loss is on the buyer, but only the seller is insured, the seller must either reduce the amount of the, of the price, correct, or turn over the proceeds of the insurance to the buyer. Time of the essence. That, that's pretty much equitable conversion. Risk of loss. So we dealt with two things here on in terms of the contract for sale, correct? We've dealt with the statute of frauds, we've dealt with equitable conversion. Again, you know, put yourself in the frame of mind. When you identify the hypothetical, when you identify the problem, correct? If you already closed the deal, then the choices, whatever in the choices, if you have a question of equitable conversion, eliminate it. Because once you close, it, you know, you're not, you're not, you're now the owner. You know, what equitable conversion does is it gives you in equity the rights of the owner. But you're not the owner. You understand? So, you know, if, if, if we already said they closed the deal and something happens and one of the choices said, oh, the buyer wins because he, the doctrine of equitable conversion, that is, it's, it's not the right choice because we're speaking of equitable conversion during the contract for sale. Those are issues. Put the issues where they belong. We still on the purchase and sale agreement, contract for sale, earnest money agreement. We're still there. We haven't closed yet. What else do we look at? What, what other issues do we look at when we're dealing with the contract for sale? Well, we look at the issue of time is of the essence. The contract for sale agreement um, fixes a date for closing. It says, we will close December 1st. And, and it doesn't say anything else. All it says is fixes the date of performance. And we can't close that day, right? We can't close that day. Strict compliance of that agreement because it only had the date specified. It doesn't say anything else. Strict compliance is only required at law. It's not Strict compliance is not required in equity. So what does that mean? That if all you did was you fixed a date, and we cannot close on that day, your only remedy is a law. Damages. You don't have any equitable remedies. So if one party shows up, you know, and the seller shows up and makes proper uh, tender or turns over the deed properly. Uh, the other party is, is not there, right? The other party is liable for damages. This is if the only thing that we have is the date specified. If that's all we have. If the contract specifies um, the only it, it, 
if, if, if the date of performance is not there, right? But um, the contract, if the date of performance is not there, and the contract specifies time is of the essence, right? I don't say on January 1st, but we must close as soon as possible because time is of the essence. You follow me? Um, the, the failure is not grounds for rescission or specific performance. A party can sue for specific performance as long party can sue for specific performance as long as the party is ready to perform within a reasonable time. Let's go through it again. Yeah. Yeah. This contract for sale says we will close as soon as possible. Time is of the essence, not specific date. Correct? Right? Uh, the, the, the parties have to perform. You cannot force them because uh, to perform because they can they are expected to perform within a reasonable time we didn't say a date we just said time is of the essence but we don't have a date correct you, you are expected to perform within a reasonable time if it's not a reasonable if a reasonable time has not gone by you cannot specifically um, force them to, or you cannot bring specific performance, or you can't sue for damages in a reasonable time. Now, after the reasonable time is over, that's a different question. What is the best possibility of all of them? When he has the, the date and time is of the essence. Because in that case, right, you can not only sue for damages, but you can go and seek specific performance. You can seek equitable remedies. If it has both. Time is of the essence. We're closing January 1st. Time is of the essence. We're not, we're not going to look at reasonable time. Why not? Because we have a date. Specific. Right? Uh, so, you know, the, the parties have to close, and it says time is of the essence, parties have to close when? On January 1st. Most earnest money agreements are like that now. Because a lot of people, to buy one house, are selling another one. So if, you are, if you're selling a house to buy another one, you better specify time is of the essence. Because otherwise, you may find yourself, right? Uh, with only with only damages and you know paying for the hotel that's all you can get you cannot force the other party to specifically perform uh, all, all you're going to get is damages and you know it depends on you and if you want to live in a hotel for a month as long as you get reimbursed that's okay but uh, you know, then you have to go and sue for damages all right that's pretty much what we deal with in the contract for sale Issues that will come up on the test, statute of frauds, issues that will come up, uh, the one of the parties didn't show up um, uh, to the closing, the seller didn't show up, they showed up, they, they, they say we can't, we can't complete the deal because the bank has not given me the mortgage, right? I need another three weeks. Uh, one of the parties wants to support damages because he had three weeks, or they want to go to court Monday uh, to force the parties to close. Those are the kind of issues that come up. Uh, sometimes, very seldom, but sometimes the questions come up where the house burns. Sometimes questions come up where um, the seller dies or where the buyer dies. Uh, most of the questions that come up, usually in the bar exam and everywhere else, is about the statute of frauds. Uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much where, where everything lies. This is where uh, most of the questions are. and. I don't know what's going to be on the test, but you need to know all those things. So, what is all this leading to? This is leading to what? Closing. It's leading to closing. At the day of closing, what is going to happen? Seller will deliver property, right? Buyer delivers a check. 
right? What are the seller's responsibility? Seller has to bring marketable title. Marketable title. The, the title that he, the seller is going to give you that day has to be marketable. What is marketable? Marketable is free from doubt. You don't want to buy into a lawsuit. That's what it means. And what's, what's the standard? A reasonable business person. Would a reasonable business person buy this property with this prop? That's the question. Would a reasonable person buy a house that has a sewer line under it? Would a reasonable person, a businessman, buy this house for $100,000 when there are cable lines going to the property? Would a reasonable business person buy this property, right, when there is uh, oil, oil, oil pipe, gas pipe under it from mobile oil or something? Those are the questions that you have to ask. Would a reasonable a business person buy a property that has a lien from the IRS for half a million dollars. The, 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 you know, would a reasonable person buy a piece of property that has a nuclear bomb ready to explode <laughs> buried under the yard? That, you know, that's, that's the standard. Would it, and I, I think you know what the answer is, right? No. I guess not. <laughs> that's what that my corporate title is. We have some ideas of what things make title or marketable, and we did some cases on this, right? One of the things we talked about was gaps or defects in the chain of title. <coughs> now, the first time we talked about marketability, we had not done recording statutes yet, so it wasn't clear what the chain of title was, right? What a gap on the chain of title was. Now we understand that better. Right? Uh, you saw a situation where you have a wild uh, deed. Or when you go up using the grant or grantee index, and you go up, and then when you come down, it doesn't match. There's somebody missing. Somebody's missing there. Oops, you know, between this year and this year, who, who, who sold the house to whom? It's a chain, it's, it's a problem. There's a gap on the chain of title. That uh, makes title a marker. A misdescription of the property. Is a gap or a defect in the chain of title. A misdescription of the property is a con constitutes a makes title unmarketable. What what else makes a title unmarketable? Um, inadequate estate. The, guy, uh, the seller told you he's going to give you a fee simple and he shows up with the life estate. That's not marketable. Why would you want to buy a house from somebody when what you're buying is a life estate? The day that person dies, what happens to you? You're on the street. So why, unless that's what they told you they were going to sell you, and you knew that, right? Uh, you, you, you don't have to get to the lawsuit because the day that person dies, the, the, the remainder or the grant or the grantor, they're going to come in and say, I want my property back, and you're going to say, no, and now we're in a fight, right? So do you want to get into that lawsuit? Of course not. So that makes title unmarketable. Encumbrances, that's the biggie. Uh, encumbrances makes title unmarketable. Mortgages. There's a prior mortgage. Makes title unmarketable. Liens. Make title uh, unmarketable. Mortgages and liens. Makes title unmarketable. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now that we know what happens when you foreclose, if there's a mortgage, right, that somebody else has, and they default on that mortgage, it's a foreclosure, right? You out of luck. Send the house in you. So mortgages and means. Restrictions. Um, restrictions, equitable servitudes. Remember easements? 
covenants, restrictions on the property, equitable servitudes, they make title unmarketable only to the extent that they be more cumbersome than a zoning ordinance. If a zoning ordinance says uh, you can have residences, uh, two-story residences, and there's a restriction limited the residences to one story, right? That's an encumbrance. Zoning ordinance says this area zoned multiple story dwellings, right? The restriction says you can only have single story dwellings. That's more restrictive than the zoning ordinance, right? Mm -hmm. The zoning ordinance allows you to have two stories. The deed restriction says only one. In that case, that is an encumbrance, makes title unmarketable. You go, you come up to the house, and this happened to me, so I lived it. You show up, and you knock on the door, and the one that opens the door is not the seller, but a tenant. And the tenant says, can I help you? I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm buying this house. I said, no, you're not. I live here. Right? And if you buy the house, I don't know if I want you as a landlord. Right? Now, do I have to buy the property? You, we know that the lease stays, right? If I decide to take it, I can waive it. So the question is, does the lease make that unmarketable? Well, what if you decide you don't want that person there? What do you want to do? What do you have to do? You have to go sue them. So what have you done? You have to go on the victim. You bought yourself into a lawsuit. That makes it that unmarketable. Now, you can waive it, but it makes it unmarketable. Eastman's. Makes that all marketable if the easement is of such a nature that makes living in the property impossible, or you cannot live in the prop in the property. What happens usually is when you read deeds, it says, um, "I sell you this house free of encumbrances, free of gaps in, in the title." <laughs> free, but subject to easements and restrictions, right? And that's why people people buy the house, they waive that, and this is why, I mean, you, you, it's impossible almost to find in most places a house that doesn't have some sort of easement. Uh, there are, and all there, but you know, around uh, urban areas, every house has some sort of easement. Telephone lines, gas lines, digital cable, everything. So don't, don't jump immediately. Just because it's an easement doesn't mean that it's, the title is unmarketable, okay? If you have to look at the nature of the easement and see how burdensome that easement is. And depending how bad the easement is, then, um, then uh, it will be unmarketable. I had a uh, colleague, I spent one year teaching at Texas Westland, and I had a friend of mine that bought a house. He thought he had a good deal. And on the day of closing, they found out that the sewer line, the pipeline goes right through the middle of the house. So the city has an easement for the sewer line, and it goes right smack to the middle of the house. Now, we know from the law of easements, right, that the holder of the easement has the duty to do what? Repair it and do all that stuff, right? So what if the city calls up one day and says, we are going, they, they, you know, we're going to clean the pipes? Or we're going to repair the pipe that's going to the middle of your house. You can't interfere with the easement. So what are they going to do? They go to the middle of your house and they're going to tear it up to get to that pipe. Right? In that case, you can argue what? That easement is bad. I can't wait that. And in fact, he backed out of the deal. Uh, he didn't get the house. All right. Whenever there is a, uh, the last thing that we need to talk about in terms of encumbrance is the issue of zoning ordinances versus building codes. Because we had a couple of cases in the book. Uh, remember the, the bulkhead case? Um, zoning ordinances are not, do not destroy marketability, but violations of a zoning ordinance does. The case we had in the book, was a zoning ordinance that had a setback for a type of a house, and uh, the problem was that it was violated. Remember, 
So it wasn't the zoning ordinance that created the problem, it was the violation of the zoning ordinance. Now here's an area that I'm not very clear about, but let me go with my understanding is, in general, building code violations, in general, are not considered encumbrances. However, there are some of your books and some of us that teach that the way we teach, we, we you know, since now the seller has a duty to disclose defects, correct? Uh, it, it, it is, it, in a lot of jurisdictions, they're starting to consider building code violations to be encumbrances. But my understanding is that the majority rule is that they're not. <coughs> Why not? Because they're things that are readily fixed. You know, you don't get into lawsuits. You know, so so there's a plug there, and it should be two, right? You're not buying through a lawsuit because it's rather inexpensive to just build the other plug. It's, you know, you're not going to get it. The city's not going to sue you in court uh, because you have one plug and not two. Uh, it's unlikely that they, they, might, they might not give you a license to rebuild. You know, if you have, to, if you want to rebuild the house or something, they might not give you a permit, but they're not going to sue you in court because you have. You know, you don't have an extra um, outlet, right? Um, however, there seems to be an emerging view that since uh, build, you know, since sellers have to disclose <coughs> defects, seller is supposed to, in some places, tell you. By the way, you know, we have a problem here. You only have one plug. You're supposed to have two, right? In that case, then uh, it is an it is considered an income. I suppose the best way to think about this is if you're in a jurisdiction, remember we spoke about disclosing in some jurisdictions, and like we saw in Texas, they have a list of things that you have to disclose. If one of those things is the most disclosed building code violations, then I suppose that Texas would say, if there's a building code violation, it is an incumbrance. If the seller has a duty to disclose. If the seller doesn't have a duty to disclose it, then it's not an incumbrance. Remember always, whenever there's a defect in the title, um, you need to let the seller know. You just don't sit around and say, okay, you know, if you, if you do a title search and you find there's a defect in the title, you, you're supposed to let the seller know so that the seller has a reasonable uh, time to... Must let the buyer know. I mean, uh, the seller. He's the one that fixes the property, he's not the buyer. Okay. The seller. You do a title search, you find there's a defect in the title, you don't say anticipatory repudiation, I'm not going in. You know, it's two months left, you have to call the seller and say, hey, my attorney found a problem here. You know, uh, if you don't fix that by the closing date, I'm not going to close. But you have to let the seller know that you found that defect, and you have to give the seller a reasonable time, a reasonable time to, uh, to, uh, fix it. Fix it. Fix it up. All right. What are the remedies? And then we move on to the deed. What are the remedies? In case of a breach by one of the parties, seller shows up with a marketable title. Right? Bu uh, buyer shows up and doesn't show up. Seller shows up buyer with marketable tire, title. Uh, buyer doesn't show up. What remedies? Um, and I want you to pay attention to this. Remedies, big word, remedies. Damages are in place. Specific performance are in place. Rescission of the contract are available. Those are the three types of remedies that you can seek. Now, you know, it took me a long time when I was taking contracts to understand that specific performance is not damages. But I thought specific performance is a type of damage. But it's not. Specific performance is a remedy. It's a remedy. And it's only available on certain circumstances. For example, in a house, if you cannot determine the price of the house, right, uh, you get specific performance. The damages. What, when you're looking at damages, uh, I mean, I'm not, there's no time to have a contract class, but uh, what is it that you want to get? What's called your expectancy damages. 
expectancy. You expected to buy this house for $100,000. Now, to get this house someplace else is going to cost me $200,000. I, I didn't expect to buy a $200,000 uh, $200, home. I wanted a one-story house, right, with a little yard. I wanted a $100,000 home. And because you breached, now I'm stuck with a $200,000 home. So that wasn't my expectancy. You know, I ended up in Sugar Land when I wanted to live in Kingwood. So that that's the that um, that's the that, that's the that's the uh, the uh, the remedy in terms of damages. Uh, specific performance, we don't need to uh, talk about that. And uh, precision, you can always rescind and say goodbye. Look, all right, all right. So let's stop for a moment.